One of the things that's really interesting about the work you guys are doing is creating machines that are based on the movements of actual animals. Right. Well, you know, animals do all the things we like to make machines do. They can climb mountains, they can go in very difficult terrain. You know, people and animals using their legs can go almost anywhere on Earth. And yet, uh, wheeled and track things are very limited in the number of places they can go. So the dream is to be able to get animal-like mobility out of these uh, machines by giving them the same techniques as the animals use. Them. So we take our inspiration by looking at what the animal can do and then trying to figure out what parts of that we can capture and work. Of course, we're also faced with having to use engineering techniques that are available to us. And we, we can't do some of the complex things that uh, or at least can't yet do some of the complex things that animals do. You know, animals have lots and lots of muscles, lots and lots of uh, parts of the brain that control those muscles, uh, very strong uh, uh, skeletons and things like that. You know, complexity is almost free for an animal, but for engineering, complexity is very expensive. So uh, that's the, the palette we have to work with. And there's specific animals that you are studying, you actually take an animal or take films of it? We do. do, do um, usually we have partners. So when we were working on Big Dog, developing Big Dog, we, uh, we had a partner team at Harvard in the uh, Concord Field Station, which is a, a place that studies the locomotion and, and respiration of uh, mostly quadru large quadrupeds, uh, dogs, goats. Uh, they do some birds like an ostrich, which has very interesting locomotion. And uh, they study the biomechanics of those animals, and then we work with them and try and bridge a gap between what the engineering of the problem is and what the biological understanding of the problem is. And they're very interesting complementary uh, tasks because the animal is very good at performing the task, but they're very hard to study. You know, you can put electrodes in, or you can put external measurements, or use cam or use films, as you've said. But and you get some data, but you can't get everything. A robot, on the other hand, you can instrument anything you want and you can get all kinds of data and you really because you constructed the control system you know a lot about it on the other hand so far the, the robots aren't up to the skill level of the animals and but having those two to work together I think is a powerful way to, to make progress because DARPA has been a, a very good supporter of us we've had you know decent budgets for all these projects and uh, we, we have a strategy that we frequently call uh, build it, break it, fix it. And we make a robot, we expect it to have problems, we take it out in the field, and we, you know, it breaks, and then we figure out what went wrong, we make a lot of measurements, and then we fix it, and then we you know, build it again, break it, fix it, and we go around that loop hundreds of times. Uh, maybe break it you know, five times a day. That's why you can see, if you look around at our staff, it's not only uh, you know, paper and pencil uh, blackboard guys, there's also lots of field testing guys, repair guys, uh, analysis people, and uh, I think that's the way to make progress. Not to try and have the perfect thing right out of the gate, but you build, you make a stab, and then you can see what you can learn by uh, uh, by getting some data back from operating it, uh, and you know make up for the things that are wrong. So that's an expensive way to go because you have to have lots of spare parts, you have to have people, and uh, I think it's one of our competitive advantages that we've been able to work that way. One other thing that I think is uh, a little bit unique to Boston Dynamics. You know, we're a company, and in some ways we're very much like a company, and in some ways we're very much like a university. You know, we have some organization and teamwork and some amount of processes that are like a company, and that gives you some capability. But we also have people who are dreamers, who do, you know, who are very smart and do more academic type thinking about these problems. And so I think of us as being right between those things, not uh, with some of the vision of, the, of university people, but some of the discipline of company, and then we work in the middle and it's like the best of both worlds, and I think that helps us uh, do our work. And what's your inspiration? What, why did you get into this? Why uh, you know, I've been, uh, part of it just comes from loving building things, and you know, I started building things when I was a kid. My, you know, my father had a bunch of gadgets. My father was a, an accountant. Uh, but he, and he would have liked to have been a mechanical engineer, but his mother told him that he couldn't be a grease monkey. And so he became an accountant. And, but our house was always full of gadgets, that, uh, some of which he'd built. And so, you know, I've always been building stuff. And our place is just, everybody there uh, has calluses on their hands because they build stuff and they love being in the shop and, you know, making the sparks fly and things like that. Uh, so I love that. And, you know, just uh, the beauty of, uh, of the agility, speed, dexterity and mobility of animals is a, is a great inspirational thing. You know, it's a, it's a high bar, uh, 
you know, I, we say we're doing animal-inspired robots, but we are so far from really doing what they do. But you know, we're making progress, and uh, that's been fun.